A couple of weeks ago, I found this listing for a badly damaged iPod Classic on eBay, and it was just so ridiculous I had to share it with the iPod Discord. Sure enough, it was in such a bizarre state that it attracted the attention of several others, including even the Elite Obsolete. But then, weeks passed and the listing was expired and relisted again and again with nobody willing to buy the sad thing. I mean, it was so badly damaged that it probably wasn't even good for spare parts, so only a total idiot would buy something like that. Right? Yep, I'm an idiot. From a quick inspection, we can see that the iPod does not power on. And we can't even plug it into a charger, because the pins in the dock connector are all bent out of shape. From the side, we can see that the entire device has been bent by some powerful force, enough to pop half of the back casing open. The back casing looks almost melted because of the sheer force, and we can see that the name James Stockard is engraved on the back. I wonder if they're friends with D. Emery? When I shake the iPod, I can hear the sound of gravel inside, which explains why I have this sheet down here to catch anything that falls out. Given the state of the iPod, I really want to open it up and see what happened, but before we do that, let's go through the teardown plan. Okay, quick summary. We have an iPod 6th generation that's heavily damaged and does not power on. Given the extent of the damage, we are not expecting it to be recoverable, so this will be a teardown and forensic investigation. I will be opening the iPod up and separating each component before inspecting and testing them. At the end, we should have a better understanding of what happened. Let's begin. Now, normally opening an iPod Classic like this is pretty tricky because of the clips on the side, but because this is so damaged, it should be slightly easier than normal. So I'm just going to start here and pry downwards. With the older generation iPods, you would normally have to pry upwards, but because the clips work the other way around on Classics, we would have to pry downwards. Right, we've got that open, and you can see one of the clips has already been bent inside out, so that's not good. And with that, the back case is off. So this is just fallen out. I think that's the cushion beneath the 30 pin dock connector. So we're just going to put that to the side. And reveal the mess. So right now there's still two cables connecting the back to the front, and we can't just pull them open yet. I'm just going to take this spudger and gently pry the battery off the back. And yeah, that's uh, quite a lot of corrosion damage there, so definitely been touching water with this one. And the battery connector came off just like that. We can see the battery connector is corroded. So Obviously, this battery is no use and it's expanded anyway. But let's just put it to the side. The hard drive's fused sort of back, but I can gently just fry it up like this. Uh, okay, I'm pretty impressed. The logger board doesn't look like it's cracked or anything. Huh, interesting. Okay. Let's, uh, let's remove this hard drive first. And if I just slide the cable out, uh, yeah, I don't think that hard drive is going to work. Let's just put that aside. Okay, the smell is really strong now, it's definitely touched seawater. For the headphone jack assembly, we just need to flip up this bit here and slide the cable out. Now the back's free. All right, let's remove the screws on the side. All right, that's five out of six screws open. That's pretty impressive. This last one's giving me a bit of trouble. No, it's not turning. Okay, so that one's stripped. Surprisingly, that's pretty clean on the board. 
maybe the cyclops touched water, but not for a very long time, because salt water corrodes metal much faster than fresh water. And there's no sign of life in here, as in no algae or anything growing. So perhaps it's just being fallen into the sea for a day and someone pulled it out. Hmm. Interesting. Right, I'll see what I can do with that screw. I'll be back. The wrestling sound is actually coming from the hard drive. That means the hard drive has suffered dust and water ingress, and the platter may have shattered. Sadly, this means that we're not going to recover any data from it, but then again, we're not expecting to, so that's fine. Okay, and we're back. In the end, I wasn't able to remove the screw, but I was able to open up the iPod by making two cuts here and here. And that should then free the chassis, which is now just coming apart. And you can see the center button on the click wheel's fallen out. And here we are. So the back plate's just come off, which means the LCD is now free. I have to be extremely careful when removing the LCD because it's very delicate. If I apply too much force, then it can easily crack. But from the outside, it looks like it's perfectly intact, so hopefully we can get it out in one piece. All right, look at that. It's still in one piece. That's pretty amazing. Let's just keep that to a safe place on the side here. And yeah, you can see just how much damage this front plate has sustained. Let's turn our attention to the logic board. Now, beneath this click wheel, we have these two Phillips head screws here. Hopefully these won't strip. These are the screws holding the logic board to the chassis, so once they're off, the logic board should be free. There is still some adhesive holding the logic board to the chassis, which I expect should be quite brittle by now. So if we just very gently push. And the logic board is now free. Yeah, that's a lot of corrosion, but amazingly, it's only very slightly bent. So I do wonder if this is still working. I mean, I'm not expecting anything out of this, but it'd be amazing if this works. The click block can be removed by flipping up this retainer. Yeah. Just flipping it to the side. This entire section here is still attached with adhesive, so be very careful in removing it. I'm just gonna gently wedge this plastic tool here underneath it and gently peel it off like this. These click wheels tend to be quite hardy, so I do wonder if this is still working too. And finally, just remove the hard drive cable. Looks like everything's intact. Brilliant. All right, after a bit of a struggle, we are finally able to get the iPod open and separate every single part. What's most impressive is the fact that the LCD is still in one piece. It hasn't cracked, but I do see a black spot appearing inside it, which means that the liquid crystal might be leaking. If it even does work, I suspect we might be getting a big white spot there. As for the logic board, again, I'm seriously impressed. It hasn't cracked or anything. It's slightly bent, but I don't see any parts coming off it. There is a very small possibility that it could work, but I'm not holding my hopes up. That being said, it's time to start cleaning everything.
Right, after cleaning everything, we are left with these six main parts. Now, firstly, this battery is completely toast. There's no arguing that, that's bloated, and there's signs that it's been shorted at the pins. So this one's definitely dead and I won't be testing it. We also have the hard drive, which is also completely shattered. The platters are completely gone, so there's no chance of recovering any data from it. And even if it wasn't bent, something's gone inside it. And the moment you open a hard drive and any air or dust gets in, that's it. The platter's gone. Now, the headphone jack did come in one piece, but there's so much grit everywhere, it's just not going to work. Besides, even if I did clean it, I wouldn't really want to put my headphones in that. So that leaves us with these three parts. The screen, the logic board, and the click wheel. Amazingly, the screen hasn't cracked, although there is a very distinct black spot in the middle. So I'm not sure how well that's going to work. My guess is that it's either going to turn on with a massive black spot in the middle, or it's just not going to turn on at all. We'll see. The logic board's looking a lot better after cleaning. It is slightly bent, and I'm seeing some lines down here, which I can't tell if they're cracks or not. But otherwise, comparing it against an image of a normal logic board, I'm not seeing any missing components. So I am curious to see whether or not this works. I'm doubtful. It will be a complete miracle if it does, but hey, who knows? And finally, we have the click wheel. There are no moving parts in this, and it's quite a simple component. It's just one touch sensor. So again, this will be quite interesting to see whether or not this works. In order to test these parts, I have this spare parts part here. It's the exact same generation, 6 gen, and all of these components should be a one-to-one -one match. So let's start putting these in and see whether or not these work. First up, we'll be testing the click wheel, and by some miracle, it works. Now, even though it's such a simple component with no moving parts, the click wheel did survive being immersed in water and then exposed to mold and all that stuff. And even with the impact damage, it's detecting touch perfectly. That's pretty amazing. All right, next, let's test the logic board. Unfortunately, with the battery fitted, we're not getting any signs of light from the logic board. Because of how complex this component is, there are so many things that could go wrong, and unfortunately, it looks like the corrosion has got to the board. If we probe the battery connector on the logic board with a multimeter, we can see that it is drawing the correct voltage, meaning that there's nothing wrong with the battery connector. This means that something else has gone wrong further down the logic board, and unfortunately, it looks like this logic board cannot be recovered. Rather amazingly, it somewhat works. So we are not getting any kind of video signal, however the backlight works. And as expected, there is a massive dark spot in the middle where the water has infiltrated the backlight panel and damaged it. While the LCD isn't fully functional, it is still amazing that the backlight still works. And that's the end of our testing. From what we've found, we can conclude that this iPod was dropped into a sea or a river and had suffered severe impact damage while underwater, which caused it to become warped and bent this way. The lack of sand and algal growth indicates that the iPod spent less than a day in the water. However, that was enough to corrode and kill the electronics inside while also allowing mold to grow. While we were able to confirm that the click wheel survived, it was so contaminated with mold that it was unsafe to use. The logic board, LCD and hard drive had all failed, and sadly this iPod will never be recoverable. Before I go, I would like to thank everyone in the r slash iPod Discord community for the time and feedback while making this video, especially Fenua for her expert advice on data preservation. 
As for this iPod, it's time to seal it away in my collection and lay it to rest so that it may never reawaken and haunt anyone ever again.